What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? They learned important lessons on the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. This is true for both men and women. Ernst & Young found that a whopping 94% of women holding a C-suite position played sports. Their wins and losses shaped their habits and who they would become. Join me on my journey to sit with some of the brightest executives in the world as we discuss how sports shaped their professional trajectory. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, the voice of America's CEO community. I'm your host, Don Yeager, and this is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is Chairman and CEO of Bank of America, Brian Moynihan. Brian leads a team of more than 200,000 employees, and he does it so well that he was selected by his business peers to receive Chief Executive Network's 2020 CEO of the Year Award. Brian learned valuable lessons from football in high school and as the co-captain of the rugby team at Brown University. Brian continued playing rugby as a young professional in fact, his colleagues at one of his first jobs at the law firm Edward and Angel remember him coming in battered and bruised from rugby the night before, but still outworking everyone in the office. He's been CEO of Bank of America since 2010, and today Bank of America is recognized as a great place to work for parents, military, and diversity. I am so excited to gain insight from one of America's great leaders. It starts with the need for preparation, learning, discipline, and mental and physical preparation. And then it starts with leadership on the field and the play, because once you get on that field, you got to lead. It's that discipline and preparation in a group setting and leading a group that is different from an individual thing that you do. And that's what sports are different. Team sports requires you to be in group settings, requires you to accommodate, requires you to motivate, requires you to lead. Brian, thanks for joining us. So grateful. I'm glad to be here. It's nice to share some time with you. Thank you. You know, studying you, your background, your history, I know that you grew up in Marietta, Ohio, and had seven brothers and sisters. And I'm just, I'm wondering, like, was it a competitive household that you grew up in? From a standpoint of seven brothers and sisters, everything was a competition just because it was. So who had to do the dishes was a competition. That taught me probably how to make arguments huh. in a way nobody ever thought of. Various of them competed in sports, but I probably did the most of anybody. But the competition was more around you know, sciences and brain power. My dad's a PhD chemist, and he was uh, led it. Most of my siblings are scientists. I am not by definition. And there's always a competition about you know being smart, being able to solve questions and which was just as much a sports competition. But it was a great household, and I owe a lot to my brothers and sisters in Portland, my mom and dad, for my success, because they taught me a lot of things and everything from how to cooperate with a big group at all times to how to make a good argument when you didn't want to do the dishes. <laughs> well, good. I'll have to make sure that my children don't hear your argument on how not to do the dishes. I don't want them to learn that one. Yeah. As you went on to Marietta High School, had a chance to go back through your high school yearbook, which was awful fun. And you seem to have been as involved a student as anyone might imagine. You had, you played football, baseball, you're a member of the National Honor Society, French Club. But I was fascinated by your time on the track team. I saw where your relay team competed in 63 races and you were 62 wins, one loss over the course of that career. Just wondering, which one sticks out to you, any of the 62 or the one? I would tell you that you've done a lot more research than I remember, but I do remember the one time I know we got beaten. It was a four by two relay or half mile relay in the old days because we didn't have meters back then. But the people had bells on their toes and all the relay teams, so they could hear each other coming. And it's one thing to be run down by somebody where you can't hear them. It's another thing, it, you felt like the cat was coming to get you with a bell around his neck. You could hear them catch you, which sped you up, but they were good. So they beat us. But it was a wonderful experience. We had a great group of high school friends that ran track. And like all high school athletes, you had success and, and you were good. But what you do remember from it is, you know, you committed to hard work, you committed to preparation, 
you committed to teamwork and a relay team, there's nothing, you know, sort of more magical and track than when you're doing a four by one or a four by two and the person's coming at full tilt and you got to make that exchange and make it work. And it's, it's a difference between, and all it's got to do is drop the baton and you're out. And even at that low level of competition, which high school is versus watching the Olympics, I still can feel that anxiety when a relay team starts on like a four by a hundred meter and the Olympics knowing that they miss that exchange there's no time to make up for you aren't that fast so it was fun just a great experience that allowed us to be successful you know it's funny because track is so often considered an individual sport but in the event that you ran you really do have to develop an amazing camaraderie an amazing chemistry any tips you might offer on how best you did that the odd thing about track is that you know it's completely objective except for the relays, because then you have to be objectively fast and you have to have an ability to actually make the exchanges. So you had some people on a team that might have been faster than one of the individuals, but if they couldn't cooperate and make it work, it didn't work. And so we were lucky that we had, nobody was a superstar. We had one fellow who was a very good runner, but in the context of the high level high school competition in Ohio, but all of us were pretty good. And then we blended together well. And so what that shows you is some people overextend in a high performance team, you know, one person, but for relay, it takes everybody being good, good enough to compete at the level. And then the additional factor that you've got to work together. And so it was about teamwork. It was about preparation. It was about practice. I don't know how many times you practice that exchange. And these were cinder track days. You got onto the, the better surfaces when you got to the higher levels, but you know, it was gritty. It was hot. You were tired and yet you're, you know, going through that exchange again. And the coach was yelling at you for not doing it right. And he should, because that's what his job was. But you also put a lot of pressure on yourselves because it was, you let everybody down if you didn't hit the end of that line at full tilt with a clean exchange. Yeah. But that concept of a team of really solid performers can often be far more effective than an individual high performer in a group who are all looking up the entire time sometimes, I would think that'd probably be a great and powerful lesson. Right. And I think the goal was to make sure that the weakest link on the team performs the highest level in the relay, again, because you can only do so much for the best people because they're already good. So that was the other thing is how do you get your fourth person, which usually was your third runner, just by the way you set up relays, to get their best time was as important as getting everybody's best time. I had the wonderful experience of watching my son compete and try. He was more of a middle distance runner and the same thing, watching their group understand that and build towards the championships and stuff. Always bringing together that last person that somebody had gotten hurt and got subbed in that you could get to the higher level performance. And I saw a great coach they had do it. So it's a common thing among sports is how do you get everybody perform at the best level they can? And then that blends together, be a better outcome. Yeah. Then you go off to Brown University and you choose to play football. But during that fall semester of your freshman year, a few players recruit you to a different sport. Can you share a little of that with us? Well, yeah, you know, so I went the Ivy League recruiting process. Even now, it's completely different, the Ivy League. But so basically, you sent your stuff in and you showed up and there was no scholarships or anything like that. So I went to Brown and played football. And we had a pretty good football team, actually, of freshmen. Yeah. But between the fall season, spring season, I ran into a guy who played football with me who ran into the guys who ran the rugby team. And so this guy had actually played rugby in high school for the University of Arizona because I think he babysat for the Arizona rugby coach. And so he was a very good football player. They said, come out, play rugby. And he convinced me to go. The older guys recruited us in and, you know, off we went. And the rugby was fun. Football, I was kind of probably hitting the point where I was okay and I need to be better. But rugby, you could find a new sport, learn it, and it was just a ball. So I played my first rugby game on our spring trip to Florida, official game, because, you know, in Northeast in the spring, it takes a little while to get the weather good enough to play outside. And I never looked back. And I played from that time, which I was 18 and changed, you know, a few months till I played till I was 31, 32 years old continuously. Wow. Then I got too old. But you know, it was fun because rugby in college is a club sport, but it's a competitive club sport. Oh, yeah. So it had the best of both worlds. It didn't have quite the regimen of a, after playing, you know, sports in high school and going into that, it didn't have the regimen of the varsity sport. But on the other hand, especially Brown's rugby team was very competitive. So we could play at a high level of competition. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. I had the opportunity last year to go spend some time with a rugby team over in New Zealand. Pretty good one, the All Blacks. Yeah. And I didn't know much about rugby, as I guess you did before you started there. And the one thing that really stood out was how rugby has a position there for basically people of all body types. Yeah. You know, there's something there for all those folks. So it's interesting when you think about rugby, you're right. It has, you know, tall people, short people, but 
the interesting thing in playing it for many years and watching is the common thing where people knew about teamwork and could play in a team. So it was interesting that I played at Brown, I played at Notre Dame, and then I played for club teams. In that time, you're always trying to get athletes and teach them the game. And the interesting thing was basketball players fared well because they knew the team sport. You know, they knew how to pass and pick and move without the ball, which rugby has a lot of that. And the soccer players could be effective because they knew the continuous nature of play. You never have a timeout. You're playing, you're playing, and playing. Football players could be successful because you know, a lot of them, are, especially some alignment, could be the props where they have to have bigger people right. and stuff and some of the running backs. And so that made it fun because it had all kinds of people, all kinds of talent. And frankly, in the college ranks back then, understanding how to play the game could make up for some athletic talent. So I would say the Brown team may not have had the best athletes on it, but we understood the game and could play as a team. I think we beat Georgia Tech in schools. You'd say, how could you do that? But it was just because we knew the technique. So what rugby looks like very brutal from the outside is extremely technically oriented and extremely team oriented. Absolutely. And it takes a team continuous play, which takes a long time for some people to get. They never get it. But the people who get it can pick up the game fast. And then, frankly, the All Blacks and me and rugby are two different skill sets. But the reality is, is that in the U.S. context, because most people didn't play it growing up, if they could pick up the game and understand the skills, it was fun to teach them. And so it invited everybody. And then you played three games a weekend with A's, B's, and C's players. So everybody got to play. Completely different thought process. Every person on the team got to play as opposed to the starting five in basketball, starting 11 in football. So it was very participatory and it was a wonderful club sport, college sport because of that. You know, and I know they tabbed you to play fly half, which requires a lot of leadership skills. Did you understand that when they picked you into that spot? that leadership would be one of the things you would have to develop as a teammate there? My progression and position followed in my understanding of the game and then being able to lead the people. So and when I first went out, I came out off the football team. I was a, you know, in probably the best shape of my life type of thing. And I was lifting and I was strong. And so they put me inside center, which is more of a physical, you know, over understanding the game. And then as you learn more of the game and because it was a four year game and you literally played your first game in your freshman year, the pace at which you learned allowed me to move to fly half and scrum half, which are the two sort of quarterbacks of the team right. for those who don't know rugby, that you're calling the plays, you're setting the field in the scrum half, working with the scrum and the fly half, making the back line effective, and then the coordination between the two of them. So, yeah, once you sort of learned it and once you had sort of leadership skills, because we ran the club as administrative side and coached the team in and it did the things you moved up. But I had that progression from just being sort of fresh, athletic meat that they threw at the task. This other fellow and myself played the centers because they just needed good, strong bodies to where after a year or so, I started learning the game and I could move into the more skilled positions. You know, I know most often people are asking you questions about the economy and what's happening in regulations. And yeah. I'm dragging you back to rugby. So I hope this isn't too detailed, but I'd love to ask in that window, you won the Ivy League championship. Big deal. I mean, obviously, because every Ivy school plays rugby at a really high level. Yeah. Is there a particular moment, maybe in the championship season that you recall that, that has stood out to you all these years later that you still remember? Well, I remember... The Ivy Championship was over a weekend, and you played three games. So Saturday was a double game elimination, and you had the championships, and it was our bracket that played out of the eight teams. And we hosted the tournament, which put an added burden that we actually had to keep track of everybody and line the fields and stuff. But the thing about rugby is because it's a team sport and everybody's moving and everybody's carrying the ball, everybody's tackling, everybody's pushing, everybody should. What happened that game is, you know, we'd finished – second and then we finished first and then we finished second over three years and so we always had a competitive team what happened that game is we just ended up playing better as a team at that time as best i can remember it's been a number of years but when you watch from the inside there's nothing more beautiful than to watch a scrum come together and move another scrum and the absolute amount of coordination that takes as a team, second only to watching some cruise shell when it's flying virtually, when all eight rowers and the cocks has them really going, you could just see the thing really just taking off. The rugby scrum's like that. You have eight people who sort of bind together, and all of a sudden it becomes this perfect motivated thing. And, I, you know, you can demonstrate to people by using pieces and show them that if the eight people come apart, all the thing blows up in the air. And it's all by how they hold together and how they move exactly in synchronicity with each other. So, and that day we played well, and that season we played well, and I had a great bunch of teammates, and they were a lot of fun, and they played well. But as people think about business, 
when that time came to bind down and move and you saw all eight people push and all eight people come together, we had a good scrum. That makes the job in the back line easy because those guys are moving forward. I mean, it's a momentum game. And if you're moving forward all the time, you may not score, but you definitely wear out the other side because they're always, you know, playing defense. Yeah, playing defense, but also literally taking you into them at full speed as opposed to coming at you at full speed. And so, you know, I don't remember every afternoon of rugby, but the feeling when you had when it was going right, the feeling that you had when the team was moving, when I played the club team years after that, when our back line got going, the feeling you had when everybody knew where people were going and everybody was performing is just a wonderful feeling. And that, you know, when you're a CEO and you watch the talent team I have perform, it's the same feeling. It's you say, I can just sit back and watch. Even when you hit a crisis like we've hit, you can watch them perform and sit back and watch them do what I know they can do and then help them at the fringes. That was the feeling of a good sports team. And just putting the right eight people or putting the right people together as a CEO yeah. allows you that ability to sit back and become that talent on the fringe that just helps advance it a little further. That's awesome. You had a coach in college, uh, Jay Fluck, who led that team for 29 years, right? I mean, I know the players, it's obviously a very player-driven team, but is there anything about his leadership style that you recall that led or influenced you as you would grow as a leader yourself? I still in contact with Jay today because he's still, they have a full-time coach at Brown, but I work with Jay on raising money and helping the team work. Right. But look, Jay knew the game. The thing was his dedication to helping players out. So what I got the pleasure of watching is his impact on kids across so many years with this consistent view of learn the game, learn the discipline, get yourself in shape, I will take you to competitive places and places you haven't seen. So if you go through and look, we went to various, uh, then went to Bahamas, is there any place we went overseas? But I went with the team as a semi-coach to uh, Wales. And, wow. you know, Jay would challenge these kids, and they've gone many, many places since then, you know, to challenge the kids and take them to places to play. And these are kids that may have not traveled a lot in life. They're kids from all walks of life, so to speak. And they would go, and he would show them places and do it. Yet underlying, he was saying, you got to have the game. You got to have discipline. We got to be competitive. We got to win. You got to be in shape and you got to learn the basics, the building blocks of the basics. And that's what he got into us and has gotten in the teams over the years is and he'd bring other coaches in that were, you know, frankly, Jay would say better rugby coaches to teach those basic skills and those capabilities. And so he didn't have all the answers. He knew that, but he would motivate the people. But importantly, he showed the kids what rugby would give them if they treated it right. If they learned the game and were competitive and played, they could see things they could never see. And that I've seen him do for 40 years. I mean, it's not like he did it for us and disappeared. He's just done it. And, it, and he's all volunteer. Wow. He's got a full-time job. He does this. So he would be there on Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights or Wednesday afternoons and Thursdays. He'd be there on the weekends and he kept doing that. And he had a family and he had things and, and Bonnie, his wife were great with their time. And, and Avery, their daughter used to come to some of the events because it, she's not a, young kid anymore. She's obviously older, but it was a dedication that we all pay back. And I've seen kids 30 years younger than me pay him back for his dedication by learning more, working harder and motivating, and then watching him teach them the skills. Because it's different now because a lot of kids play in high school in the U.S. and then kids come from outside the U.S. But back then, literally no kid had any knowledge of the game when they arrived on the Brown campus. Yeah. So think of it, he isn't like recruiting that best, but he had to teach those kids to play at a high level and compete even against people 10, 15 years older than them, compete against international squads. Right. They had to learn, you know, the basics, but they also had to learn sophistication all at the same time. It was, and he was good at teaching that. And I love the way, as you described it there, his dedication to you was contagious. It led you to be equally dedicated, not just to him, but to those who would follow behind you. He's in the Brown Sports Hall of Fame because of what he's done to support this team over the years on a true, you know, giving of themselves basis and that kind of servant leader, you know, doing it for the kids, mm -hmm. doing it to help make them better. Again, really on a volunteer basis was tremendous. And what an amazing number of lessons I'm sure you learned there. I read a story of a profile of you written in a student newspaper at Brown yeah. in which speaking of these international experiences, one of them talked about the idea that you had the chance to compete against a group of South African players that came over and it was years before Nelson Mandela had been freed and, but there was so much there that you were able to learn culturally in that experience. Can you share a little bit about that? It was the first black South African team to leave the country to play internationally. Wow. They were uh, 
a good set of rugby players because they were from a country that's unbelievable. They were brought over by one of the legends in South African rugby, and he created controversy by doing it. Mm. And it was before, you know, this was 1980 or 81 type of time frame. So way before the country had been where it is today. And so it was really unique. But think of yourself as a 20, 21 year old kid. And we actually, because they're older men, we had to bring in a couple of people from the local club team to at least give us a big enough pack to withstand them. And they played and they stayed in a dormitory at Brown. And then they had a party with us after the game and they would sing songs. It was just a wonderful experience. They had a bunch of, you know, 19, 20, 21 year old kids mixing with a bunch of 25 to probably 25, 30, 35 year old South Africans. A lot of them had worked in the mines and stuff and just singing with you and learning from you. And it was just an experience that you couldn't get. And that's one of the wonderful things about rugby is not only is it a discipline game that you played and we played at a high level at Brown and I played at Notre Dame. I played at Providence Rugby Club after. So I played a lot of years. It gave you these experiences of, you know, here's an experience of a chance to interact in a world that was going crazy about apartheid and all this stuff going on. You were next to these talented rugby players talking about their life. It was the first time any of them left the country. Most of them had not been on planes before, and so cool. and they were dropped in Providence, Rhode Island, on a college campus. You can imagine from their side, this must have been the wildest thing that happened. Right. I can only imagine. But that's the beauty, again, it's the cultural aspect of all sports, right? I mean, we don't care much. I know diversity is so important to you, but you know, in sports, your race or background isn't as important to me as the ability we can to maybe create something special together. Yep. I'd recommend for your listeners the movie Invictus, which yeah, is uh, the best. Everybody thinks the movie about rugby is actually a movie about leadership <laughs> completely, and how that team came together and then won the championship. And Nelson Mandela's approach to the team is one of the great movies on leadership there is. It's a movie about rugby, but it's about leadership and how you lead, I think, is a great lesson for all societies, especially in the world today. I agree. You know, the premise of this entire podcast, Brian, is this idea that you know, there's some great research out on how impactful sports has been into the learning curve of many great leaders. Do you agree that your history in athletics and even long past college allowed you to learn leadership skills that you use today? Well, I think, look, anytime you have a group of people who've been put together as a sports team is that can, you know, be very different people. Some are naturally gifted beyond belief, not me. Some work hard. That was more my case. And the chance to lead them as a captain of the team is obviously a leadership lesson of high order because you're voted by them to be their leader. And that's, you know, that's an unusual thing. That's big. And frankly, in business, that doesn't happen. People select you to be the leader, but you better have the skills. So I think sports and athletics and competition with teams also you learn how to deal with adversity. Nobody's perfect. Everybody loses games. The question is, what do you do about the loss? What do you learn from that loss? How do you make sure that doesn't reoccur? And sometimes you're going to lose to people just better. They're as good as you're going to be, and they're just better at all positions. And you learn something that, which is how do you build a better team? You know, how do I, what do we need to do? And sometimes effectively, that means that you got to make changes. So that's a part of it. And then preparation, you know, how do you get ready for any event that occurs? So we all gone through a crisis in the world in 2020. And how do you manage through crisis and how do you think about it? It's about recognizing power and teammates and how to communicate and how to motivate and how to reassure, but how to have empathy, but not too much, you know, how to have discipline and all the things you need to be successful. You know, those are things you learn in athletics because it starts with a common purpose to win a game and event, but it's the group of people who nobody said you get to handpick your group. You got what you have. It starts with the need for preparation, learning, discipline, and mental and physical preparation. And then it starts with leadership on the field and the play. Because once you get on that field, right. the coaches... They're still in the sidelines. And so you got to lead. I think rugby for 14 years is a participant-led sport of high order. The coaches really, even at the international levels, they it's not like they're calling in plays or you know they're making some substitutions. But basically, once the team's on the field, the leader in the field, typically the scrum half, or is leading. The scrum leader is leading it. And rugby has that element. So I think that idea, you got to lead at the point of attack. And there's not going to be people telling you what to do every day. got to learn. So I, I think that's very analogous. But then you say, what about people aren't athletes? There's similar types of things. There's clubs and other things that go on in life. Sure. It's that discipline and preparation in a group setting and leading a group that is different from an individual you know, thing that you do. And that's what sports are different. Team sports requires you to be in group settings, requires you to accommodate, requires you to motivate, requires you to lead, requires you to step back when somebody can actually do something better than you and let them do it 
you know, all that is very important for business. I think. Was there a, a most important or a moment in your leadership journey post athletics where you leaned back on something you learned there that you might share with me? Well, you know, I think if you think about things I learned along the way, the idea of thinking from out to in part of it was embedded in athletics. And what do I mean by that? It's customer service and focus on customer first and everything in the business context. But on the other hand, I always thought that, you know, you needed to think about all the teammates, not just the star teammate. You need to think about how everybody's relating to it. So I, being probably a reasonably good athlete, but not the best player on the team by far, but having generally a lot of responsibility to getting all the people involved, you know, that idea of how do I get the people who need to be involved, who are not naturally the only person to be involved. The star running back, the star rugby player is going to be involved because you have to. Right. But on the other hand, how do you, how do you make sure the other six or eight players who may not be up to that person's quality are performing at the highest? So if you think about the crisis we face, the issue is not the strongest links. They take care of themselves. The issue is making sure the weaker parts of the enterprise are up to shape and driving at that. Thinking about out in, making sure everybody's prepared, listening, not presuming you know what to do, showing that we're in this together and it's not just me you know, that I've got to figure anything out that we're in it together and how do we figure this out together and then support people, you know, and in the end of the day, providing the support they have to be successful. Yeah. That's really what draws you to being able to define that organization as a team. If those are not the pieces that you're pulling together, you're really not, you're really not a team. We use the word teammate here and sometimes people, you know, they use associates or colleagues or whatever. we've used teammate here for a long time because I think of it that way. I think we at Bank of America are in a competitive war to win. <laughs> We're in a, you know, a war to run the business in a way that demonstrates we can produce profits for our shareholders and deliver what society needs from us. And it takes teammates to win the battle and to win the war. And, and I very much have always come at this saying, you know, I want people to be on the leadership team. And therefore, we've always used the word teammates because it was easy to use. It's about a purpose. We got what we're doing as a company. We're helping people live their financial lives. We're driving responsible growth. These concepts are for teams to execute on. They're not for individuals to, and then say that it worked right. They're for teams to execute on. So we've always believed that, you know, it, you got to be careful over analyzing the sports analogy because sometimes people say, well, I was an athlete. How do I fit in? Everybody fits in. Right. Almost like rugby, right? There's a spot for everybody. Yeah. Practice and discipline and preparation and performance. Those are concepts that I don't care how you got here, where you came from, what your ethnicity was, what your socioeconomic status that got you here after 14 years of playing competitive rugby, that was a unique thing. I mean, I had colleagues that were doctors and I had colleagues that were house painters and everything in between, and they were all wonderful and they didn't give me any quarter, even though I was a lawyer by training and they treated me as a, just another teammate and I treated them likewise. And that was fun. You know, you obviously had that opportunity to lead the rugby team. 15, 15, on, 15 playing at once and usually had like 40, 50 total teammates. Right. So you're a captain, you're doing that, but now you're leading a team of 211,000. How do you scale what you learned to be able to be a great leader, even to a large number? Well, that was one of the interesting progressions in business that I went through. And I try to, with my HR colleague, Sherry Bronson, we try to build our development plans around this question, which is scale. And it's just different when you have that many people. So, you know, my HR colleague has a group of 3000 people working for him, which is many work for many companies in total, not just the HR function. So, she has to be a great manager, a great team leader, a great effective thing, as well as an expert in HR. You know, the legal department has a thousand people in it. So the head of the legal department, Dave Leach, has to be a great leader. And so scaling leadership is something I learned when I came to Bank of America. I'd worked for a large company, but you suddenly became a very large company who had been a very large company for a longer period of time and had to think about scale. In my mind, the way you scale is simplicity of message, discipline of process, communication pattern that goes through the whole organization, deep into the organization. In other words, you think about it from the person who has to do the work back to the people who come up with the ideas, not the other way around. Right. So I always say an idea is easy. The question is, can you get somebody, can somebody actually do it? Right. Execution. And that's something I learned early on from one of my uh, people who worked for me. He said, Brian, those are great ideas, but I'm not sure these colleagues out there can do them. I said, you're right. Let's go back and re-engineer 50% of what we thought we want to do from their standpoint in, and then they could do more. So so the idea of thinking about that, that's the scaling. It's not just how do I have an org chart? That's the easy part, frankly. You can draw an org chart. Right. You have to think about how a simple idea gets through and how simplicity in discussion, consistency, 
repeating yourself because in the end of the day, if you take 200,000 people and you say 5% of people retire, leave in the course of a year, that's 10,000 people have never heard the story next year. Right. And so you have to repeat and repeat and repeat the same messages over and over again so that everybody really knows because that's how you build culture ultimately is a culture is what the team wants to do. But if you can't get everybody to describe it the same way it happens and then, and then you don't leave anything to chance process and controls and environment to have the ability to scale. So when we say things at the top, we actually have measurement systems that we can make sure people understand what we mean by them, or at least they tell us they can. And then just, you know, trying to maintain contact. Right. Our company's flat. My email that you see in the public domain is my email. Nobody reads it but me. Wow. You know, so you can send me an email. Any teammate can send me an email and you respond to them. You try to maintain, even though it feels like a huge place. There's eight layers and you know, the job of me and the management team and others is to work through those eight layers, right. not depend on them to do it. Yet they're very important, critical managers to make things happen. But from the broad, who we are, what we do, why we do it. And the important thing is why that's got to get laid out to people because people want to know why we're doing X, Y, or Z, not what to do. We can tell them what to do. We need to know why. The why, absolutely. And that's what management role is. They're the keepers of the why, as I call it. Can I ask, last question. In 2020, you were named CEO of the Year by Chief Executive Magazine. Um, I had the chance to listen to the presentation and your acceptance. What a great recognition by your fellow CEOs. That's really powerful. One of the challenges of leadership is sometimes it gets really lonely at the top. Some amazing people have crossed your paths. I'm just wondering, is there a personal board of directors for you, someone, a group of folks that you reach out to, to try to continue to learn? Well, number one, my family and in particular, my wife, who's known me as long as anybody and keeps track, you know, so that's always good, but you know, good CEO mentors across time, you stay in contact with them. I've been lucky to have people took an interest in me, you know, so I went to see Jack Welsh. I first became a CEO and he took the time to see me and talk to me about what he thought. And then I spend time across industry for to listen to other people and how they do it and pick up information from them. So you just have to listen and read and never feel you have the answer. And so you're lonely, but you become a bigger sponge. And then how do you take that and think about it and play around with it? So whether it's, you know, the major consulting firms, their ideas are coming at you and you're learning from there. But importantly, one of the things about the various industry trade groups, for lack of a better term, is you're in settings where the hallway conversations, you can hear people talk. They bring people in to provoke thought, messages and intelligence. And so the idea is just to be a sponge. That all becomes your personal board of directors. So some of the colleagues that wonderfully talked about, yeah, I got my real board of directors who I rely on for counsel. Yeah. You know, at, at Jack Bowman, our lead independent director, and Lionel Noel will be our lead independent director after Jack retires. The members on that board, you know, you're talking to all the time. But the real thing is to get it all and just keep absorbing it. And now there's kernels of stuff that makes you interesting. And I go back to this idea that I always, when people say, you know, what do you have to do? to maintain your freshness. That's a hard thing as a CEO because now I've been CEO this is my 11th year. So 11. I've had the same job. The job I've had longest in my career has been the CEO of Bank of America, believe it or not. And to keep fresh, you have to keep challenging yourself and get new ideas and your team has to challenge ourselves. And But you also have to just maintain curiosity. So when I get asked by that young kid in the crowd, you know, what do I need to do? I said, you got to be curious. Brian Grazier wrote a great book called A Curious Mind. And that just talks about how he maintained curiosity through his whole life so far. And he's prodigious in terms of what he's done. Right. I commend people to read it because it's short, but it's really the point. You got to maintain curiosity. And I've been lucky to have all these people who would spend time with you or listen to your questions and then, you know, take advantage of settings where you can get that information. Well, for those of us who were curious about the pathway that got Brian Moynihan to the very top of one of the most extraordinary organizations Thank you so much for the time, Brian. I'm so grateful and respectful of all that you've achieved. Thank you. And I look forward to continuing to stay in touch, I hope. Thank you, Don. And thank you for spending the time and stay safe. There is no doubt that rugby is a tough team-oriented sport. I love the story Brian shared about contagious dedication. As a leader, if your team can tell that you are giving your all, that dedication spreads. It's contagious. Remember, if you ask your team to be on time, you must be as well. If you ask your team to show respect to each other, you need to be respectful to any and all. You set the standard.
Thanks for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you left us a rating and a review. We will be rolling out a new episode every Wednesday. To be the first to listen, subscribe to the podcast on our website, corporatecompetitorpodcast.com. Plus, as a thank you gift, you will receive a free chapter from one of my best-selling books on the habits of high-performing teams. Stay in touch by connecting with me on social media at Don Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next week, I appreciate you.